How much do you really know about what, what goes on in the school? Not a lot. Not a lot. It's very hard to find out, too. Mm. It's very hard to become involved. Most parents have a feeling that school has closed doors and they're not very welcome. And this has been built up from their own experience of what school was like. I think a lot of parents feel that the teachers know much more than we do, than they do, and they're scared to make any comment because the teacher is there as a little white god and they know all about teaching and parents aren't supposed to know anything about teaching. The problem communicating with the parent who is concerned about the child and who doesn't feel reasonable with the school system themselves. They are only going very often to become teachers and find out what's going on. The problem comes with the parent who, for whatever reason, regards the school as something substantial and anything associated with the school, letters from the school, newsletters and so on, as things that you avoid if you can. Um, go to the school yourself to talk no. about it? Or? I've been there once and that was enough seeing once and that was enough for me. And what, what, what happened? I didn't like it. What put you off? I don't know, it's just the way they teach them over there. How do you talk to somebody who doesn't want to talk to you? And this is our big problem. What sort of things do they do? I just can't remember because I've seen it all in about a quarter of an hour. I've yeah. just seen enough. Not the school, set in the community, funded by the community, to serve the needs of the community. But communication, the exchange of information between the school and the community, and more particularly between teachers and parents, is often considered by both sides to be less than satisfactory. This film examines communication problems from the point of view of parents and of the school, first in general terms, and then as they arise out of two particular educational issues. Finally, it presents a series of ideas that have been found useful in narrowing the communication gap between the school and the community. Too modern. Yeah. They're not learning enough, they're just sort of changing it over all the time. You can't follow it. Yeah. And the thing is, I don't like, you can't help the children if they get stuck with something in the gear like that, and that's when you, we can't, cha we can't help them, they've got to do it themselves. Mm. We do it for them, it's, it's the wrong answer. We must find ways and means of communicating. We have a few families that we haven't been able to communicate with, and we feel very sad about that. We still are discussing in staff meetings how can we get to these families whom we'd like to see, like to talk to, who never come. Well, he sees me coming down the corridor, he just... He's, he's out next, next door and he ain't there yeah. when he sees me coming. Do you think he reckons you're a bit of a troublemaker, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. Bit of a too hard to turn him two or three times, I scrapped him once I don't <laughs> ram him through the wall. Yeah. You start feeling a little aggressive towards that parent until you, you calm yourself down and try to get to the bottom of it with parents. But that first feeling of aggressiveness mm. is rather nasty and sometimes you think, oh, I'm going to be sick, particularly if they are particularly aggressive towards you. About yeah, also I've got one, one boy, he's eight, he's got bad kidneys. So the teacher won't let him go to the toilet when he wants to go. That's so how he comes home with wet trousers. I can't build him for it. I've been down, I've even got a doctor's certificate. Took it and put it into the headmaster. And it's the same thing still going on. I had to go down there again the other day about it. But then you've got to realise too that they don't see the other side of the situation and we haven't seen their side yet. So the only way to get to that is to sit down quietly and be very pleasant and say, look, would you like to come and sit down and let's talk about it or invite them back to another date if it's not convenient. We shouldn't have to march up. The avenue should be there. We should be able to just go oh, yeah, and yeah. talk over a cup of coffee and say, look, I really would like to talk with you about the reading in my child. Mm -hmm. or I'm terribly worried that you aren't teaching maths at different levels. It's all being taught at one level and I feel that my kid should be doing it at a higher level, for example. Just let's sit down and talk about it. Let's not get uptight and... Uh... Yeah, because what then, uh, when they get the complaint back from the education department, the poor kids are going to suffer, isn't they? They're going to be on him all the time. The poor kids won't be able to move. But I think this is what we all feel would happen if we marched up to a classroom and made a fuss because our children weren't being taught as we thought they should be. To any parent who went to school in the 50s or 60s, the look of a modern, well-equipped classroom can be off-putting. The layout of the room, the system of teaching, and perhaps most of all, the technology employed, can give many parents the feeling that their understanding of what's going on is inadequate. But even when parents are not frightened off and the school is doing its best to be informative, there is no guarantee that communication will be clear and uncomplicated. Right back in 1972, we just opened up the doors and told everybody to come in, and many parents did that. and. Um, it didn't bring the results we wanted, really, because they saw 
uh, children not all with a table and desk and a blackboard and all facing the front and so they wondered whatever this sort of education system was about. We found later on where we could actually bring parents in and ask them to assist in the classroom and they had more time to look and to listen and to observe what was happening and um, understanding seemed to dawn very slowly. And we One particular issue that raises its share of communication problems is learning outside the classroom. Many parents don't see the value of excursions. Some may let the school know their feelings, and some may not. And the school may or may not explain to parents the educational processes taking place. Being able to, to touch and to smell and to do these things with, with the real thing. I mean, you can, you can sit there with children, you can show them pictures, you can talk about these things, but to actually go and see them for themselves, to be able to pick them up, to hold them, to touch them, to smell them. I think these are the things the children need to do. They need to, to have real experiences that they can relate to. Other than that, I prefer them to sit down and do their maths and English and social studies, things like that, and get away with the education so they can get a job. And you don't see sort of any edu educational value in kids going to the things like that at all, as far as you're concerned? Well, not that sort of thing. Some things are all right. What, what, what things do you object to, would you say? Things yeah, like ABC that. concerts. Or you might as well fall to sleep, but <laughs> let's go to see them. They don't understand that. They want a bit of rock and roll, something like that, and listen to that. Yeah. They don't understand what it is anyway, a lot of them. And some of them feel, oh, yes, it's reasonably good for the kids, and we get others who think that uh, these excursions and camp programs are just put on by teachers who are too lazy to teach the children. Do you have communication from parents who simply can't afford to send their kids on activities of this kind? Yes, uh, we have some supplementation from the Priority Projects program in Tasmania, which enables us to supplement the cost of a camp by one third. Money's the killer, what do you so mean? I just don't send mine on it. I just send a note to school saying that they can't go and that's that. Yeah. And, and what do you do, you keep them home, do you? Or? No, I send them to school and then they come back home afterwards. The, uh, or they get, get transferred to another classroom. Uh, but as for too many of these excursions, there's far too many of them for my life. They get in the school work, but there's far too many excursions. Yeah. Especially for, uh, for, pa for parents that's got a job to keep up with it. I'm sick of it. You just had a look at a tree that you really liked, didn't you? I want you with your partner, each of you, to choose a tree. Some have a look around. Just wait for a minute, boys. Have a look around for a tree that you really like. One of your favourite trees. And I want you to, Angela, are you listening for a minute? I want you to hug it. I want you to listen to it. Have a listen to the trunk. I want you to feel it. Look at the branches. Look how tall it is. Look right down and see if you can see any little insects on it. We'll see what sort of things you can find on it. And I want you to really find out as much as you can about your tree. OK, off you go and choose your tree. Use your partner. And uh, does this cover the exigencies of, of most parents, would you say, who are, who are really hard up? I think it would cover the exigencies of most parents. It would certainly cover those who are really concerned about the matter, but for the others who don't see any great value in it or who don't want to see any great value in it, well, it may be $12 worth of beer money, mightn't it? My money on a pension. I had $18 here last month for my daughter to go to Guatemala for three days. I mean, I've got four t three children going to school so far. Yeah. And, and what happened? Uh, well, I, I, I'd had to pay the money or she couldn't go. Yeah, yeah. And, and did you pay the money? Yeah, I had to, so she could go. Right. But all of her, you know, all of her friends and that went. So she gets filled out, she's getting left out all the yeah. time. And uh, did you sort of approach the school with your problem? I mean, did you explain to them your own yeah. personal situation? Yeah, no, they, they often knock $3 off. It's very hard to gauge as to whether they in a lot of cases, the, um, the parents would be only too willing. You know, as, I, as you said, I think a lot of them are shy, and I yeah. think uh, you know, once we you know, got to them and talked to them, I think yes, but I think in a lot of cases, you'd be lucky to, uh, to uh, get through the door, as you say. Yeah. Has the school ever made any attempt to give you good reasons for, them, for the kids going to concerts? No, they just send home letters to say there's a concert on such and such a day, how much it'll cost and one thing or another. So if you don't agree with it, what do you do about that? I keep the kids home, let them have their day off rather than go. Right. And what does the school say about that? They don't say anything. They don't worry much. So, mm -hmm. End of story. If you don't want to go see it, we just don't go see it. <laughs> oh, 
send money for children to go on excursions for the reasons I believe that they feel that it's a waste of time and when they come back uh, nothing there's no follow-up about it it's just a day out in other words mm -hmm. and, I don't think uh, they really understand what's no going it's on. and it's difficult to to get them here to ex if we could get everybody to come on excursions they would see the type of things that happen well, and the type of things that follow up but Sorry. it's getting the people to come in the first place to find out you know just what is happening in the could be. Water just trickling down, could be. It's amazing the information that's been coming out in, in their discussion while they've been working. Um, one little boy was comparing a leaf that was on the table. It was just a skeleton of a leaf. And he was actually comparing it with a skeleton of a bird that was in the room. And I thought that was, you know, really interesting. This sort of observation would happen without that first hand experience. Back in the school, many parents find it difficult to come to grips with the complex grading processes being used to assess their child's progress. If parents see the school structure in terms of their own school experience, they may become very confused. In this classroom, several groups of children of widely differing ability are working at different levels at the same time. A parent used to traditional classroom organisation would have no chance of understanding what's going on without a clear explanation. I arrived in the classroom one day and, and found that they were reading and was interested to see what, what they were reading and found it was very lower standard than my child could read. So I was interested to find out why. And um, was, the teacher then told me that um, it was because, uh, it was because she, they wanted to, them all to be reading sort of roughly the same thing. And I found it very hard to um, accept that and yet I found it hard to sort of continue the conversation because I didn't want to feel I didn't have confidence in the teacher. It was, uh, so why do you were... And yet I felt that my child should be stretched a lot more. Um, she was reading stuff that, that she'd read you know, a couple of years ago. So while you were dissatisfied, you decided to I, leave it at that? I felt, yes, I felt completely incompetent at sort of... Um, and, and I didn't want to, the teacher to feel that I was trying to tell her what I thought she should do. And yeah. are you sorry that you left it at that? Uh, yes, I am, and I'm still sort of wondering what I can do about it, actually. Mm. Do you have parents coming to you say that, saying, my child is being kept back? Yes, we have when had that, that happen. that is not the case? We have had that happen. What we try to explain is that the child is going on from the exact point it left on last year, regardless of what we might call that class. What we do is to carry on from the exact point we left off last year. So it wouldn't matter what you called the class. The result would still be the same for the individual child. Do you think you understand the reason the school groups the way it does? We're not allowed to know that much, uh, but yes, they, they put those... Well, they have varied reasons. They put them in groups because uh, they're all at that stage, the, the different groups, and also the, um, one child will aid another child. We have had problems here. We try very hard to communicate with parents. At the beginning of each year, we have a parent-teacher nut when we explain the overall philosophy of the school. We have this in three levels so that we can talk specifically at the one area. And we try to tell parents our overall policy. Then the parents have a chance to go to the classroom and discuss in greater detail with the teacher any problems they might be experiencing. Well, I know of a situation where a mother approached the teacher because of her son's uh, abilities in maths. He was bright and um, I know the teacher has been trying now to give him difficult work but he's suffering now but from the other children I know. My daughter comes home and says uh, her friend, uh, he couldn't do one today and they must really rub it into that child so why interfere? 
they're inclined to compare one child with another within the same room and say, why is this child reading a certain level and why is my child reading something else? This concerns them. And are you able to explain satisfactorily to them what the situation is? Yes, normally we like them to come and see in the classroom and see the setup so that they can realise that we are hoping that their child is working at the best possible level for that child at that particular time. These children are being taught sporting skills by volunteer parents. As a result of this experience, these parents are likely to understand the school better. Many teachers and parents are constantly trying in different ways to bridge the communication gap. Here are some examples of ideas and situations that are making a contribution to better communication. When, you, when your kids first came to the school, um, what was your impression of the school? I didn't like it. Why not? Um, the open plan, the way they were taught. Um, to me, I felt that the kids just weren't learning anything. They could please themselves what they did, when they did it. Whereas I was, to me, school was you sit down behind desks and learn that way. But um, how, did, how did you get your impression at the beginning? I mean, did you come here or were you told about it or, or what? Uh, from the kids, when mm -hmm. they come home, what did you do today? Oh, no, nothing, you know. Um, sort of never brought home much work to show what they did during the day. Uh, what they did bring home, it was a mess. Spelling was wrong, never marked right and things like that. Parents were upset that we didn't mark out every word uh, and they thought somehow or other that was connected to this open plan building but of course it was general throughout the state of Tasmania at that time. Also our reading scheme came under criticism at one time because we were teaching from a language experience program and uh, parents couldn't understand how children could possibly learn to read from their own writing and this was another thing that mm. had to be explained. I saw the headmistress. Yeah. Um, we had talks. She tried to explain um, the way the school was run, but I had my own ideas and that was it, you know. Because then I sort of started coming down to school and getting more involved with the kids and um, watched the way they worked and found that they sort of all work on their own level. See, a lot of them came into the classroom and, you know, asked why we weren't teaching reading. And then after, say, a few months, when they found that their child could pick up a, a book and start to read it, you know, they were quite amazed at how this could have possibly taken place without us teaching anything. Mm -hmm. you know. Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> so you've really gone from a situation where, you know, you were anti the school That's to right. a situation where you really... I really poor. like it. Mm. Mm. I would. Okay. We've no right to embarrass the parents in their own home situation. Now, if a teacher goes outside school hours, uh, then the kids are at home to start with. Everybody in the neighbourhood looks around and sees, gee, there's a teacher standing on the front door of Mr X's place, God, I wonder what his kids have been up to, or something of this nature. Uh, the people may be quite embarrassed, uh, not knowing whether to stand and talk to you at the doorway when all the uh, neighbours and so on are going to be looking on and the kids are going to be running around, or take you inside when neighbourhood speculation probably gets even higher uh, and, you know, find a place. All our houses are in a mess at some times. And so I think we've got to be very careful about uh, embarrassing the parents because that's not going to help us get any message across. It's one of the sad things for me that a lot of conversation takes place between parents which obviously doesn't get to the teachers and for me it's lucky because I have had a lot to do with the teachers here and I have a friendly conversational setup. but a lot of parents I think find it very difficult to bridge this gap and one wishes in a way that there could be a little microphone in on these conversations. I think it's important for uh, the avenues between the children and their parents to be kept open so that children can come home and say what, what is wrong or what is right. It's, it is terribly important that parents listen to them and then uh, take up that point with the member of staff concerned. Well, they sent home the kids' report one year and they asked, was there anything that you'd like, you know? And I said, I'd like um, to bring back about an hour a day or something for the parents to go and catch up on the maths and English and stuff so they could build the kids with home. But they did that, they was running that at a long while and that was good. And, and you really got something out of that, do you think? Yeah, well, we learnt these new modern sums, you know, like when we was going to school it was pounds and some pence and not metric. And uh, this about um, Pythagoras and what have you. 
Well, I don't know a thing about that yet. You see, I've got to learn that. If I don't know it, how am I going to tell the kids if they're doing their own work wrong? Parents and friends died a death last year and uh, four of us turned up to a meeting one night and the, the two parents that turned up and the two teachers that turned up decided that maybe we'd better scrap that. The idea of parents and friends as it was maybe had to change. And so Bev went to work on a parent council and asked parents about it and sent out letters asking who would like to join a parent council. We explained that there was to be no president, no secretary, no treasurer, therefore there'd be no pressure on, on parents to take up these positions and therefore keep minutes. And uh, so along they came and uh, we just discussed what they want to discuss, parts of the school program. Uh, they talk about um, what's going to happen to the school and um, who are the new teachers going to be. Uh, just, you know, general sort of things that they're worried about. We all relate to our experiences which, that we had when we were at school. And if we see things are different, we become suspicious and it's difficult to understand it unless people have talked about it. I know this is my feeling. I've had to break down various conservative attitudes and I'm fairly involved so I can understand other people preferring to keep things the way they experienced them when they were young. And I think this is one of the major problems is education really for parents?